another uh, very interesting panel, a, a different angle this time, and that is uh, services in the developing world, which is an extremely relevant topic. Um, one, because so many of the uh, member companies of CSI and, and other um, uh, participants are looking at the markets in the developing <coughs> world and uh, certainly want to understand better what are the opportunities there, what are the issues that the developing countries themselves have. And so we have a very uh, good panel for that. It's going to be moderated by Sarah Thorne, who is the Senior Director for Federal Government Relations at Walmart. And our panel includes uh, Dr. Aditya Matu, who is the Research Manager at the World Bank. And if you're not familiar with his work, you should be, uh, because he has done an awful lot of really strong work on uh, developing countries and the role of services and the, uh, what services can offer to uh, developing countries and the policies that developing countries uh, should be taking. We also have Mr. Brian Biren, from, who is the Executive Director, Global Public Policy at eBay. And then uh, Mr. John Carey, he's the Chairman of AIG China. I suspect there may be a few questions directed to him. And then also Ms. Arancha Gonzalez, who is the Executive Director at the International Trade Center in Geneva which is, if you don't know the International Trade Center, it is, a, it is an institution that is, um, I guess it's a co-sponsored by, it's connected to the WTO and to the UN. And uh, Arancha has uh, recently taken over as executive director of, uh, of the uh, ITC. And Arancha has a uh, long history in trade, uh, first uh, in the EU or the EC, and then at the WTO. So I think we've got a very strong panel and one that has varied perspectives on developing countries. And so I very happily turn this over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. <coughs> and thank you also for doing the introduction part, which is always the hardest part of being the moderator. So I think <laughs> we can actually go right into the panel. Um, just a couple of overview remarks. When we were preparing for this panel, I was really excited actually to be part of it because I think the perspectives here are both from um, academia, business, as well as the ITC are really important in actually looking at both the challenges as well as the opportunities and services in the develop in developing and developing countries, as well as this sort of interesting um, time that we're facing when the actual services negotiations are very much among developed countries. And so how do we bridge this gap? How do we talk about the importance of services to developing countries as well as the opportunities for overcoming um, challenges and barriers to services in developing countries and opportunities for engaging developing countries in the negotiations. Um, I also want to thank you all for staying for the panels in the afternoon. I thought I was going to start us off maybe with a Walmart cheer, but I think that might be a little <laughs> too much for this <laughs> afternoon. But if anybody's interested in learning it, I might be convinced to teach it later. But we're going to start with Aditya, who's going to give us an overview, kind of lay the land, and then we'll go to the business perspectives and then wrap it up with Arancha after that. So over to you. Thank you, Sarah. I would like to thank uh, Peter and the Coalition of Service Industries for inviting me here today. Um, they say power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try and control this presentation rather than let it control me. So if certain slides rush past your eyes before you've had time to read them, that's how it's meant to be, okay? So I'm going to make um, five points. First, the expansion of services in developing countries, which is the subject of this panel, has been inhibited, despite dramatic liberalization in the last few years, is still inhibited by protection, both at home and abroad and there are substantial gains from further reform. That's point number one. Point number two, international negotiations, not just the multilateral negotiations, but also for the most part regional negotiations, have failed to deliver additional liberalization beyond levels countries have been willing to undertake unilaterally. So negotiations have locked in a lot of reform, they haven't pushed new reform. And I'm going to say this starkly, and challenge some of you 
because I think it's critical as we invest new negotiating energy in new agreements that we try and improve on what has been accomplished in the past. And the third, but more optimistically, I'll argue that there are two big changes happening, and some of them we've heard echoes of already over the course of the uh, day today. First of all, the advanced developing countries are beginning to see services trade and innovation as a way of breaking out of this middle income trap in which they are currently often uh, trapped. And the second big change are the demographic changes, especially in industrial countries, which I will argue are creating new pressures for reform in industrial countries, especially in the services sector. And I think this change dynamic, both the greater confidence and self-awareness within developing countries and the pressures for reform in industrial countries might make it possible for international cooperation in services to take new, more ambitious forms than it has taken in the past. This is a picture based on a database that we spent the last few years putting together. And what it shows is the levels of openness the countries that are covered in the database, 103, are in some variant of orange or pink. The gray are the few countries on which we don't have data. The lighter you are, the more open you are. And what you see there is that it's true that the industrial countries are, on average, relatively open. But quite surprisingly, some of the fastest growing countries in South Asia and East Asia have among the most relatively closed markets. The poorest countries differ dramatically. A country like Cambodia is very open. A country like Ethiopia is very closed. When you look at the picture across, I'm not quite sure where I should point this in order for things to move. Yes. That's the picture by regions and sectors. All I want you to take away from this picture is that the OECD countries, which are relatively open, on average, are nevertheless still quite protected when it comes to professional services, especially where it involves the movement of people, and are still quite protected in areas like transport services. For example, air transport continues to be sort of tied up in bilateral air service agreements, which are often still quite restricted. The richest countries in the Middle East, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the fastest growing countries in South Asia and East Asia are still relatively protected. And that immediately raises a question. Have these fast growing countries stumbled upon some sophisticated formula for gradual reform? Or are they paying a, paying a big price for continued protection? I will argue that the evidence suggests that there are costs to protection. We have done a detailed study of India, which involved looking at productivity in thousands of manufacturing firms. And we came up with a surprising fact that services reform has not just unleashed productivity growth and services exports in India, but even the revival of the manufacturing sector has had more to do with services reform upstream, which improved access to telecommunications, transport, and financial services, than to reform even within the manufacturing sector. Now, that's an example of a country which is reforming unilaterally, gradually. But in some cases, you can't do it alone. It really does take two to tango where it comes to transport services. And here our research suggests that more restrictive transport policies are associated with more expensive and poorer quality logistic services. This is important. We have heard about how one of the early harvests that we are going to get from Bali is a trade facilitation agreement. But the gains from this, it's a little bit like you know, Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark, that you're going to get customs reform, but you're not going to get competition in transport services. And there, our research suggests the biggest cost savings could come from more competitive transport services. And if a country wants to reform air or maritime transport, it can't do it alone. If Zambia wants more competition on its international routes, it needs to have the agreement of South Africa 
United Kingdom. And so it is a bit perverse that the WTO has de facto excluded transport from the scope of its services negotiations, air transport explicitly and maritime transport implicitly. This is a picture that I've shown often, and again, just very quickly, the red dots represent actual levels of openness in individual countries measured on the vertical axis. Countries are just arranged along the horizontal axis according to their per capita income. The blue dots reflect what they committed to in the last Uruguay round negotiations. The green dots, what they have offered in Doha. And what I want you to take away from this is basically that the best offers that countries made in the Doha negotiations didn't even come close to capturing the openness that already exists, let alone promising new liberalization. Now that, I think, most of us suspected. But many of us have thought of regionalism and preferential agreements as the new sort of mantra. And it's sort of fashionable these days to think of protectionism as the dog that did not bark during the crisis. I think regionalism is a dog that has barked, but doesn't seem to have bitten much. Because again, when you look carefully at a lot of these agreements and you ask, how far have they induced countries to actually change their policies on the ground? And the answer turns out to be not much. And you, know, you can think of Costa Rica doing something in telecommunications and insurance, but you have to look with a magnifying glass to find examples of regionalism delivering significant reform. So let me stop there for a second to reflect that there is protection and international negotiations haven't done much about it so far. What is changing? First of all, developing countries are seeing and developing a new stake in trade and innovation and services. So this is a study of a relatively advanced developing country, Chile, where we again looked at firm level data both on trade and innovation and from this complicated picture, all I want you to take away is that far fewer services firms export than manufacturing firms. Again, not unexpected. But the premium on size is much smaller in services. So that's a question maybe that Brian is going to come back to. Is that participation in services trade seems to place a smaller premium on being big, but it does place a premium on having access to skills and ideas. And that matters because when we look at the pattern of spending on innovation, we were quite struck by the fact that the tradable services firms end up spending almost as much on innovation as the manufacturing firms. And that forced me to think hard about, and we saw nice examples from you this uh, in the previous session on what this innovation might be, but I was curious, what is innovation and services. And I'm going to show you a few pictures. Enax is a Chilean company which has become a global pioneer in providing rock blasting services to mining companies. And how did they do that? First of all, that huge vehicle you see is the world's largest truck for mixing and loading of explosives. And it's apparently incredibly safe because of having a flurry of trucks going back and forth. It's just one big vehicle which contains everything. It's equipped with IntelliBlast, which calculates how much explosive is needed, where it should be planted. A GPS device transmits that innovation, information to the machine, and that develops customized explosives in terms of location. Apparently, it's a global pioneer. The port terminal in the region of Ariaka and Panicota has innovated along multiple dimensions. The whole layout is apparently innovative. How they allocate slots is innovative. They've automated the whole data collection system and how to track load. And these are the reasons where innovation in Chile, and there is another picture, but I'll rush through it about in um, retail, where Chile is becoming, and you probably know about this era, and base major exporter of these services to the rest of Latin America. And what is also interesting is this mutually reinforcing relationship between trade and innovation, because it is the firms that export which are doing the most by way of innovation. And that's why it's not just a Chilean story. When you look at India, China, about which some of you know much more than I do, you will see that there is a great sense of awareness that 
a, if a large chunk of your economy is in services, how much you export and reap the benefits of external demand and what your productivity gains are domestically will be a driver of development. That's one big change. The next change I want to talk about is something that really affects industrial countries. That picture you see measures dependency ratios. And in the morning session on insurance and subsequently we've heard really interesting references to the aging issue. And I think one interesting aspect of it is how that creates a mismatch between the demand and supply of face-to-face -face skills. That picture shows to you just what is happening to the dependency ratio in the OECD countries. It's going to increase as the share of the elderly in population increases. The dependency ratio in many parts of the developing world, there's South Asia there, is continuing to decline. Perhaps many of you don't know that a third of the retirees in the United States over the last few years have headed off to developing countries. A two or if two or three percent of retirees continue to move, there'll be two to three million American, American retirees abroad. Why? It's not hard to see. As you have cuts in the real value of your pension, you're going to look for cheaper care, cheaper health care. And we have been celebrating the fragmentation. Everything from a Barbie doll to an iPad has been fragmented so that production takes place all over the world and different countries specialize. And we reap the gains of comparative advantage and specialization. It's happened even in services, where accounting services, architecture services, where bookkeeping is done in India or the design is made in Colombia. But it hasn't really happened in face-to-face -face services. Health, elderly care, even education. Sure, there is scope for distance education, but you still need face-to-face -face contact contact when you are dissecting bodies in a laboratory. That hasn't really happened. Now one dimension of that could be letting providers move, but the other dimension is letting consumers move. Our research suggests, and again this is unreadable, but if the United States didn't have disincentives, this paper appeared in Health Affairs, so if you're sufficiently interested you can go back and read it there. But basically the point is that there are big cost savings from people moving and consuming healthcare abroad. And when you look at the healthcare question, the puzzle is that so few people actually move. Why not? Because, and this is my provocative question to you, John, <laughs> that insurance is the problem. Oh, sorry. It's not about consumer caution. It's not about inertia. It's about insurance because first of all, public health, even as we are struggling with this question of escalating health costs and how we're going to provide it, there are big gains from trade in healthcare and they're not being realized because public health insurance plans simply don't cover treatment abroad. The, bi the bigger puzzle <coughs> is that even private insurance plans typically cover insurance only in the case of emergency care. Now there are some innovations happening. There are examples of Blue Shield Blue Cross covering treatment or offering lower premia or lower deductible to people who are going abroad for treatment. But why is this not happening more? And there is a simple solution. And the solution is for insurance to be portable and to cover not just the cost of care but also the cost of travel. Because otherwise, and I would love to hear what you think about it, because the gains from people moving abroad only a fraction of them accrue to the consumer. But the consumer is obliged to bear the whole cost of travel. So a simple insurance program that said that we'll cover all your costs provided they're lower than what you have to pay here, including travel, would immediately eliminate the home market bias in the consumption of healthcare. But that doesn't mean that it's only the industrial countries. The developing countries have to find ways to improve care and credibly signal it. There are institutions like the Joint Commission International which offer this kind of certification. And, can I go on for a few minutes? Oh, it's just, yeah, okay. can I just have these in front so, of me? <laughs> the red light needs okay. to There might be a <laughs> guillotine hovering. <laughs> so, so and, and, and the developing countries need to be able to use the revenues from these exports of uh, services to try and expand domestic care so that you don't have this fear of crowding out. 
Now that elaborate example on healthcare, I could go on about savings in education, but I'm gonna rush through it to just say to you, for example, that just as in Barbie dolls and iPads, there is a standardized component to education and there's a more sophisticated. And you would expect in an integrated world that the standardized component is provided where it's cheapest to provide it. Sadly, access to you know, understanding diseases or having bodies to dissect, sadly, all that is much cheaper and easier in developing countries. If medical students spend the first two years of their education in a developing country, that could save $90,000. That's 40% of the co uh, cost of a medical education. And in this world where we have heard all through the morning of the importance of education and skills, and we heard about uh, equality of opportunity at lunchtime, I think trade would even the world out. We need greater flatness in the world where access to education is concerned. And at the same time, there is a problem in developing countries. They restrict investment in higher education. So what we would like to see is the John Hopkins of this world combining their quality certification, their understanding of education with skills in developing countries to offer standardized care that is portable. And that's the second portability that's missing. Education is indivisible. You can't carry two years of an education qualification across borders. So just as we need greater portability in insurance, you need greater portability also in education qualifications. But anyway, putting these two things together, trade and innovation, new stake for developing countries, aging pressures, creating a need to consume services abroad, but that's not all. We were looking at patterns of Europeans leaving their countries. Spanish, 100,000 Spanish people typically left in the mid 2000s. Arantxa, are you Spanish? I am. Do you know half a million Spanish people left in the last few years? And where do you think they went? Only one third of them went to Europe. <laughs> Sensibly, many, a third of them went to Latin America, a quarter of them went to Africa and Asia. And that reveals that there is a mismatch in the skills demand and skills availability because of the shift in economic dynamism. Brazil needs 60,000 engineers every year. It produces only 40,000. It makes sense for countries where unemployment is one in four to look for opportunities in the developing world. So both in, as consumers and service providers and individuals, there are new opportunities opening for people in industrial countries to look south. So for the first time, we might begin to see two-way flows of people. South-north migration will always be true because innovation, and that's where I think the po points that we heard in the last panel are critical, that there are always going to be powerful magnets to draw people to the industrial countries, whether to innovate, whether to work in sophisticated or acquire sophisticated education and skills. But there could be scope for the movement from south to north to south, whether it's for students to acquire standardized skills, whether it's sick to acquire medical services, or the elderly in response to the reduced pension benefits that we are seeing. And these two things together, I feel might change the complex of how international negotiations are today conducted. And we might see scope for a more proactive approach with developing countries seeing the domestic development imperative for reform and opportunities offered by the changing environment. And there I'd suggest, if anybody would listen to me, that the large developing countries would do what China is already contemplating join the trade and services agreement and de facto multilateralize it by their very presence. And enter it not grudgingly accepting these standards that have been exogenously set, but by demanding and setting new levels of ambition, which are consistent with their stake in greater openness at home and abroad. What could they say? No new restrictions, especially on cross-border trade in business services, and more open transport. And in that context, more open data flows sub subject to reasonable prudential concerns. Pre-commitment to reform, if they're not ready to open up today, if India is, wants to do this gradually, 
lock it in and use that gradual promise of gradual opening as negotiating currency. And in return, greater assistance to develop the regulatory assistance and regulatory cooperation that might provide them with the reassurance they need to open their markets. And finally, greater scope for two-way flows of individual service providers and consumers, perhaps where necessary, with source country obligations on screening and certification to provide the reassurance that people need to let people move. I think stating that level of ambition could have a radical impact on the way negotiations are conducted today. Thank you for being indulgent. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think you have set the table very well for additional conversation and certainly kept us all awake. Mm -hmm. So I think what I'd love now for Brian is, is to put a little more practical examples on this new global services economy and what you're seeing at eBay and especially with your new role, how you're thinking about these issues. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, I don't have any slides, but I do have some notes, so I'll try to try to hit first off what I was hoping to talk about. And one thing, one of my favorite quotes of all time for those who remember back to the 1992 presidential debates and Admiral Stockdale and his great line, who am I and what am I doing here? <laughs> I often, I try to use that whenever I can, primarily because I often wonder myself, what am I doing here? I do know who I am, thank God. I'll get to that stage in life and then, and then I'll really ask both questions all the time. Um, and, and you know, honestly, I work for an internet company, but tend to talk about commerce and stuff as opposed to cross-border trade and services, because the services in the in the context of eBay Inc. businesses tend to be um, services that that facilitate commerce and actual things. You know, it's they're primarily used by small retailers around the world. Um, so it's a. It, I'm also an internet company representative who is not talking about the opportunities uh, for growth from other internet companies, nascent startup, internet services businesses. Actually, these are primarily n not what you would consider if you saw the people, tech companies. They're regular old fashioned businesses all, all around the world who are using technology and technology based services because increasingly they're ubiquitous and, and everybody uses them. So it's technology serving what are not technology industries. It's not that we're going to have millions of people around the world all become, you know, internet marketplace service providers, but instead they use internet marketplaces and global payments to do the kind of business they've always done, but they can do it globally, which is which is why I'm here. Um, and then and then lastly, eBay Inc. is obviously a big global company whose primary markets are big developed countries, but the, w we, we are talking and I am talking about really small businesses. And, and that's a key thing is that most of the stuff that is sold on our marketplaces around the world are sold by businesses, small businesses that are like less than 10 employees. So even even sort of governmental definitions of small and medium-sized enterprises, which tend to be businesses, let's say, smaller than 500 employees, we're primarily talking about businesses that are like less than five employees. And, and what's remarkable is how these businesses are global. And, and it's actually, I'd love to see a show of hands of all the folks in this room um, who work for companies with five or fewer employees. <laughs> you probably little services su su suppliers. How how many countries do you export your services to? That's the coalition of services no. industries. Oh, okay, <laughs> so that's the. That. <laughs> Generally, most global trade conferences and things like that don't have a lot of folks in the uh, in the room with less than five employees. Um, and historically, around the world, small businesses tend really not to export much at all. Um, less than one percent. And when they do, it tends to be because they have, let's say, an owner has a personal relationship, maybe a family relationship to another country. So they tend to maybe export to one country. A couple years ago, we at eBay realized, first, honestly, on the policy side, it was almost anecdotally, just sort of meeting small business people and having them tell us about how many countries they were selling to. And as an old, as an old trade staffer, I see Meredith Broadman over there. She remembers 20 some years ago when I was on Capitol Hill with her doing trade policy. 
Um, she doesn't look like she's been doing it for 25 years, but I do, I know. Um, and they're all exporting. And I'm like, wow, these are one, two, three person businesses mm -hmm. talking about how they export 25 or 30 percent of their, of their sales to 25 or 30 countries. And I'm like, that does not happen. Like, Sarah knows, the number of the top 10 US retailers who export more than 25%, uh, percent, I think it's two. I think it's Walmart and Amazon. Um, on eBay in the United States, it's like 250,000. But they all have, most all of them have like less than five employees. And so we said, wow, let's look at the data and actually study this. And we learned, in fact, that more than 95% of the, of the small businesses on our platform sell abroad. They average approximately 30 markets per year. Um, and the, the internet-enabled global commerce marketplace is much flatter than the old world of doing business in the sense that it's easier to access markets, survivability by new firms is higher, and the distribution of sales among firms is much more broadly spread out than it is in the offline world. These are all great things. But the first couple years of our studies, honestly, were based on data um, from our big markets. So the US and Germany and the UK and places like that. Just about a month ago, we put out another study. Um, we call it eBay for Development. And it confirmed what we suspected, which is that the global marketplace created by internet services, so that's kind of the hook to the services world, is it, it's global everywhere. You know, the n internet is obviously inherently a global network, an open global network, and entrepreneurs and small businesses are using it literally everywhere. And when they do, they almost <coughs> have to work hard not to become exporters. And so, in fact, all of the same general data points and trends that we saw for small businesses in the US and Europe, they were actually confirmed when we started to look into those who use our services in Chile and Peru, Ukraine and South Africa, Jordan, India, Indonesia, and Thailand. And so, why did we look there? Well, one reason was um, because we suspected it was true and we wanted to find out if if we could go around to places and say that's actually true, that this works in the developing world. Part of why we do it is we believe that there is tremendous social benefit globally for globalization and the global economy working for everyone. And this is everyone from the perspective of the small as well as the really big. But this is everyone in terms of the developing world along with the big, rich, developed world. And to be able to show that that is possible, we think that's a really valuable thing. We think it's something that policymakers around the world actually care about. Um, we also have used our data and worked with some economists to show that there's tremendous economic value to this. That, that if you believe that trade works and that if you believe that cross-border commerce actually brings greater efficiency and wealth creation, more of it's better. You know, that's why we all believe, right? That's why we deal with trade agreements and we try to grow open markets is because we believe the bigger the open market, the more value is created. The reality is if you drive that openness out and down to everybody, you create a ton of value. And, and one of the things that our study showed was that if all commerce were, uh, ha were occurring with the reduced friction that occurs with internet enabled commerce today, you'd have a 15% GDP increase globally, which is a crazy big number, so it uh, can't not possibly be true. But that's what the number shows, because the reality is the reason why there's so much of this small business commerce going on cross-border is because the internet reduces a bunch of friction. So it's great from an economic value. And honestly, if you care about spreading and expanding global free trade, we know for the a fact that there are a lot of developing countries around the world that aren't too keen on the idea and suspect that it really doesn't work for them. And this is concrete data that actually it does. That it does work for their, not just their couple of giant businesses that oftentimes dominate their economies, but for the mass of really small enterprises that 
have an opportunity to engage in global commerce in a positive way. So it can hopefully convince countries, so some of the countries that we, pit, we, we picked, we might have picked because we thought they were kind of important from a global trade perspective, um, we can now go to their governments and others can go to their governments and say, this is really important for your small business community too. So it's services, and, and so from a policy perspective, what we then are talking about and advocating for are first of all policies that do maintain and expand access to the global internet and its service providers. So expanding access to the internet, li intermediary liability po you know, policy at a national level that allows third party intermediaries, whether they're big businesses like eBay um, or small internet entrepreneurial businesses, the ability to not be liable for the activities, the nefarious activities maybe of your users is really important for the internet working. So that's a really important uh, policy aspect. And the reality, and I speak now from the perspective of PayPal, global cross-border payments, global electronic cross-border payments is just utterly revolutionary when it comes to su supporting cross-border commerce. The idea that a small artisan in India can sell a product to a consumer in Germany or a consumer in the US and get paid, for example, via PayPal, and I'm sure there's probably somebody from Visa in here, and they'd say Visa too, um, in particular if they have a merchant account, uh, then you know that opens up the world. And so openness to innovative payment services is key to expanding this. But then it's also legit, you know, services in like old fashioned logistics. I love the slide that you had up there on like trucking and shipping. You know, the reality is when you're a little business and you're trying to sell around the world, you gotta move stuff, you know, by packages. Walmart is obviously revolutionized over a couple decades, moving like shiploads of stuff all around the world. Uh, this little businesses, little retailers on eBay, they're moving packages. They wanna need to move packages around the world. And so working with the third party service providers in the moving stuff space, you know, and, and integrating greater harmonization of national postal and shipping and customs and duties systems is absolutely critical to allowing these little businesses to engage in this global commerce. So I will just um, kind of wrap up by saying that um, it, harmonizing the, it, having global trade go through the kind of um, logistics and um, trade facilitation type you know, there was a round of obviously trade facilitation that occurred in the big global trade agreements years ago, I mean decades ago. You know, not the exciting stuff, but the sort of make ports work better, make shipping for really bigger companies work better. Having that revolution occur for really small packages moving around the world, we think that's really critical to unlocking even further this commerce. But this globalization, this change in the global economy opening it up to tiny businesses. This is not something that like, I'm a technology person saying, no, trust me, this is gonna happen in the future, like you're gonna have robots in your house in 10 years. This is something that actually is happening out there in the real world right now, and there are concrete economic, social, and really trade political gains to be made with really changes that are not highly technical. They're, they're actually pretty simple, but but they'll yield real world results. Thank you. I have a million questions for both of you, but I think we'll do the yeah. panel first and then and come back to questions. So shifting a little from you know, the small and the big enabling the small, John, I wanna talk to you a little bit about AIG and AIG in China and also you know, putting in context where Aditya was, but what, how do you think about when you, where you go? And what are the kinds of things in terms of, I'm not gonna ask you about portability of health insurance, well, but um, you know, <laughs> as a business that's, that operates in developing economies, right. what are the kinds of things you look at? What are the things that you need to make your business work and how does it relate then to some of these barriers we're seeing in, in global economies? Sure, global um, <coughs> thank you first of all for inviting me. Uh, I'm gonna make this a little bit more provincial since uh, I've been in China for over 10 years and uh, was seconded there as part of an investment in a state-owned enterprise and worked in a state-owned enterprise in China for five years, which gave me a unique view of the market in China. Uh, as listening to everyone talk uh, this morning and, and earlier today, 
Uh, China is part of everybody's uh, global uh, growth uh, uh, plan and strategy. So uh, the interesting thing in the topic today was the opportunities and challenges. And if you look at the Chinese characters for both opportunity and danger, they're the same characters. And I think that's uh, very prophetic in, in what's going on. Um, what I, I'd like to say that uh, I read somewhere, and I think it's a great uh, description on the evolution of China. And the first is that <clears throat> it's not your grandfather's red China. It's not your father's made in China. Today, it's China Incorporated. And so I think we have to, to look at it in that context. And uh, you'd be amazed at how many people come to uh, Shanghai, which is a fabulous city. And if you haven't been there, I'd encourage you to come. But when you come there, there are people that are expecting to see Mao suits. And uh, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, you would see that. And if you travel out to the West, you may see that. But it's a totally modern country. So uh, competing there is, is very, uh, is very uh, difficult. Um, there are a number of companies that come there. When I was based in Beijing, I would, I would, there were companies that were coming to either uh, do some due diligence on getting into the China market or looking at expanding in the China market or starting their business in the China market. And after having a number of conversations over the years, I've come up with what I call the eight kind of guidelines for doing business in China. And um, I, I hope this relates to what this topic is today, but uh, I, like I said, I've heard a lot about China over the last uh, uh, morning and last evening, so I figured this might be more topical, or at least topical. Um, again, uh, the, reason I, the reason I use eight is because eight is a lucky number in Chinese, and uh, usually there's the three guarding sin, uh, principles or the seven uh, prevents or, or some number, so I chose eight. And so um, these are, th when I talk to people about doing business or starting business in China, these are the, these are the, uh, are the key items that I cover. Uh, the first one is a focused strategy and business plan, and I know it sounds simplistic or common sense, but when people come to China, there are so many opportunities that rather than focusing on two and three and executing them, what they'll do is they'll focus on 10 or 15 and, and get very frustrated and not focus on any of them and find that their business moves even slower than it does usually in China. And sometimes they get lost. Um, Another, another uh, uh, number two, what I'll say, is a, a long-term view and investment. Again, it sounds like it's simplistic, but people forget that. Uh, I think to have a long-term view in, in China, you can't only measure the dollars and cents. You have to have metrics for your company so that you can see that your progress is being made by making advancements on your strategies, not just in your dollars and cents. It can't be measured quarter to quarter. The Chinese waited 100 years to get Hong Kong. You have to have a long 5, 10, 20-year view in China. And AIG's view is, is, is even longer than that. We started in China in 1918. Uh, we, we were the first insurance company allowed back in 1992. Um, you know, our view is for the next 100 years there. So you have to have a long-term view. Uh, core values and business flexibility. Um, what I'll talk about there is in core values, there's plenty of opportunities to get in trouble in China. If you look at highlight cases like Rio Tinto or uh, Glaco Smith Klein, uh, recently, uh, you know, there, by by operating uh, below the core values of your company, uh, you can get into trouble. Smith Klein, Glaco Smith Klein's uh, business has fallen off 61% in China. I just read that in the paper just the other day. Um, so what you have to do is you have to have to understand the core values of your con of your company, and as well the people that work for you inside the country have to understand the core values of your company. That's very important. Uh, adjusting and business flexibility. Uh, I'll use Walmart as an example. Walmart uh, has been in China for a while and has been frustrated and, and moving kind of slowly. I, I just read recently where they've changed their strategy. Rather than opening up in every big city in China, what they're going to do is cluster around the, the uh, facilities that they already have open. So they've, they've looked at the market, they've recognized the strategy that will create a winner, and they've adjusted to it. So they haven't stuck to the strategy that they had outside of China, but adapted inside China with their core values. Uh, one of the most important ones that I always look to was rule by law versus rule of law. And I explain to people that come that rule by law assumes that you're guilty and you have to prove your innocence. And if being the legal person of a company in China, you want to know that. Um, Cold War hot competition. The political environment and discussions that take place outside of China affect your business on a daily basis. They affect your employees. They affect your licenses. They affect your regulatory 
uh, enforcement. And so when the US or European countries uh, may have some conflict with China, whether it's over currency, trade, or whatever, you, you can notice as a business person there the change in the environment uh, uh, when you're trying to do business. Uh, hot competition, I'll just say that, you know, again, going back to my comments with uh, China Incorporated, your competitors are agile, they leapfrog in technology, and, and, they, and they're ready to compete. So uh, you, you have to empower your staff on the ground to be able to uh, react and, and take advantage of the opportunities in the market. Um, number six, I think that this is something that I learned when I was with the PICC, is that you have to understand to be understood. And, and when I talk about this, I mean you have to have a learning organization. And in and, and, and learning, what you want to do is align your interests with the government, the regulators, your business partners, and your employees, so that you can understand what their, you know, their interests are, align with those interests, which will allow you to execute your strategy. Uh, the next one I'll talk about is, uh, you know, everything is negotiated and negotiable. And so when I, you know, my wife and I, we go to the markets in China to buy knickknacks or whatever, and they, and they say you know that you've been an expat too long when you have more knickknacks than your grandmother. I've surpassed that by a few times. Um, but, but when you go to the markets, you never pay the full price. You always have to negotiate. And if, if you go and you pay the full price, it's almost like the person you're dealing with is disappointed. They like that negotiation. And it's in their business culture, it's in the country culture to negotiate. And you find that in business, you find that in everyday living. But, but everything is negotiable in China. And there's always a way out. Um, and the last one is uh, patience and perseverance. I think you, you know to operate and to build a business in China, you have to have patience and you have to persevere. And, and lastly, I'll say you need a sense of humor. Because uh, without that, uh, you might be, uh, you won't last long in China, to tell you the truth. So in closing, I, I'd just like to say that, again, I, I, I think my comments can apply to many emerging markets, but because of my background, China is where I've focused. Um, I think China faces a lot of the same challenges that emerging markets, uh, other emerging markets. The environment, uh, both the air, which you see a lot of on TV now, but also water, which is even more important. The pollution of water is very important. Unemployment, they have six million college graduates a year that they have to find jobs for. Uh, education, uh, throughout the country, education is, is uh, a key challenge. Food safety, um, Walmart again, uh, their business model outside the US, I mean outside of China, is uh, lowest price. In China, their value proposition is really food safety. And, and the confidence of the brand that Walmart brings. And other companies, New Zealand uh, uh, milk uh, manufacturers that we talked about last night, the same thing. Uh, healthcare, the aging population that you talked about, or healthcare in China, is a, is a, is a critical issue. Uh, the aging population in China is, uh, is, is climbing astronomically and will be much larger than two thirds of the population by 2030, I believe. Um, and then the economic challenges. China is not, you know, they have banking issues, they have loan issues, housing issues, uh, inflation issues, and, and, and currency issues. And so there are a number of issues that are, that are facing China and all emerging markets, so it's not just a one-way street. Um, having said that, uh, I, you know, I don't want to end on a negative note. If you look in China, they've created more wealth, more millionaires and billionaires over the last 30 years. They've lifted more people out of poverty, well over 250 million people. And they're a trading powerhouse. As I mentioned earlier, everybody's uh, uh, strategy, every global company strategy has China in it. And so I think that the opportunities for service companies you know, uh, in, in China will only increase. I think that the, as the Chinese begin to go out into, the, uh, out into the world, and they do have a go out policy, which means go out to the West. They purchased buildings in, uh, they just purchased the Chase building in New York. Uh, they purchased the, the meat company in, uh, in the Midwest. They purchased a lot of commodities out of uh, Africa and Australia and Latin America. Um, as they go out and have to deal in this business environment, they bring back those learnings of how international business works back to their country. And I, and I think you've seen, I've seen over the last 10 years, a major change, not only in the, the trade policies or, or the way they behave, 
but also in the expertise of the people that are executing the contracts and, and operating in the business. There's a much more, um, uh, more business savvy individual in China. So, um, so I, I'll just close and say that uh, I think there's plenty of opportunity and my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Renta, coming back to you, um, let's, let's end this looking at this part of the panel, looking at, you know, what are developing countries doing in services? You know, are they doing enough? What's the state of play and, and what more can be done to encourage increased trade and services for developing countries? So I guess that my starting point would be why does the CSI invite a development agency like the International Trade Center to come to this conference? And um, I see two reasons why they would want to invite us. The first one is because we work with the small and medium enterprises in developing countries. We help them get export ready. And on this one, I mean, I think if anyone needed any convincing after Brian spoke, uh, I can only reinforce his comments. Second is because services is the great good news for all these small and medium enterprises in developing countries is what and I'm, when I talk developing countries, I don't only talk emerging countries. I talk least developed countries. I talk landlocked countries. I talk Africa. I talk Central Asia. I talk East, uh, East Asia. Those that don't really naturally come to mind when we talk uh, services. And yet services is a huge great news for them in that it allows them uh, to jump over their geographical and developmental limitations. So um, we are extremely interested in participating in this discussion because we think services are great news. If we look at the figures, and just to complement uh, the uh, data that Edita gave us, uh, the, s the participation of developing countries into the services, world services market has trebled in the last 20 years. Uh, but what I would say is that behind these big numbers, and they, these are huge numbers, lie huge disparities with least developed countries only representing about 0.6% of world trade in services. So a small and medium enterprises, least developed countries, huge untapped potential in the area of services. Now, we've heard a lot about opportunities. I want to focus a little bit on the constraints because what we do is address, try, help countries address and help a small and medium enterprises address those constraints. We've heard about skills. I think there is a huge skill gap, uh, and I think a lot of the efforts that have to be undertaken to help small and medium enterprises get export ready in the services area is get, uh, get the skills upgraded. Uh, second, not surprising either, the domestic regulatory legislative environment is sometimes not really conducive to getting uh, expert ready and to uh, getting tapping into the services uh, markets. Third, uh, infrastructure, digital infrastructure, connectivity, uh, again, uh, a huge limitation uh, in many areas, although I know that a lot of the companies that are represented in this room are working hard to uh, help address this constraint. Now, if we look at these constraints, uh, and if we look and if we look at the opportunities, why is it that uh, developing countries, less developed countries, are not um, are not making a greater effort on the services side? And I see three main reasons why this is happening. The first one is obviously the less you know about your market, the more you become risk averse. And I think a big problem with the services is that the kind of information that is available, uh, the market intelligence that is available, the information, the regulatory uh, aspect of services are hugely difficult to understand for many countries. So there is a huge gap that uh, we need to uh, address in making sure we've got the right data and the right information for countries to be able to confidently enter into uh, services liberalization. So institutional capacity building will have to be a huge part of what we collectively do. The second is um, services, and again, uh, 
I'm going to repeat what Brian said. The benefit of being the last speaker is that you can uh, go back to what everyone else has said in the panel. Small and medium enterprises are the huge part of the services story, but small and medium enterprises are not necessarily always well organized to be a voice that can take on uh, more and better organized vested interests domestically. So it's the small versus the big. The smalls are a lot, they are huge, they are large, but they are not organized, and therefore their voices are often not heard, even if hearing their voices, listening to their voices, would lead to lots of regulatory changes in the countries. Third, um, and this is applies to developing countries, but frankly I think it applies to developed countries too, services and regu regulation of services is in the hands of many different ministries. There is not one ministry in one country that deals with services liberalization. It's in the telecoms ministries, in the energy ministry, is in the transport ministry, is in the healthcare ministry, and so on and so forth. So having uh, dialogues at home, public-private dialogues, where all this myriad of different interests uh, can be uh, can be addressed in some sort of coherent way is, in our view, in our experience, uh, what, uh, what needs to be done. Now, what does the International Trade Center do to address uh, all these constraints and all these difficulties? And uh, apologies if this is going to be a bit of a commercial, but um, what I would like to do through this exercise, and I only have seven uh, points, so maybe I just add an eighth one in order to be on my lucky number, um, the reason why I want to walk you through these uh, points of what we are doing for the um, small and medium enterprises in the services sector is because you can do a lot to help us partner in addressing a number of these constraints. So the first thing we do is try to help the uh, business community be better organized. Now, there are lots of coalition of services industries in this room. My dream would be that in each one of my uh, least developed countries, there would be a coalition of services industries. Um, so for that, the know-how that you have of how to organize yourselves um, is extremely valuable. We are doing this, for example, with the Australian uh, Coalition of Services to help transfer that knowledge in uh, a country such as Indonesia. We are trying to help in a country like South Africa we are trying to help in a country like Uganda. So I'm giving you this so that you understand there is a role for you uh, in trying to get the services sector better organized. Second, we support the small and medium enterprises in uh, moving into higher value addition, uh, in uh, being able to join into value chains. So uh, on this one, we are talking to companies such as eBay uh, in order to see what else we can do together to help uh, the small and medium enterprises move up the value chain. The third thing we do is business matching. Bringing business in the south with bring business in the north. We did this very successfully in Bangladesh with the IT sector last year. Uh, at the end of the day, for us, the best thing that can happen is that business talks to each other. Fourth thing we do, all right, fourth thing we do uh, is we help trade and investment promotion organizations. They are, again, a big multiplier voice of the small and medium enterprises locally. Fifth, huge potential for helping achieve coherence in places where there are regional integration processes, whether it's in ASEAN, whether it's in the Caribbean region. We work with the uh, small and medium enterprises and with their um, associations locally to make sure there is some coherence in the way services are going to be uh, liberalized and regulated at the regional level. Sixth thing, and on this one, uh, we think we need to have a little bit of a closer look, is um, addressing uh, the difficulties in financing a small and medium enterprises services exports. We have uh, discussed a lot trade finance for manufactured goods, especially during the crisis, but we have spoken much less about financing for services trade. And we think this is an important 
uh, part of the story which uh, we need to dig uh, into uh, more. Finally, uh, mentoring and incubators with the private sector. And on this one, uh, after we finish this panel, anyone who's got ambitions to be uh, incubators, uh, to be models uh, for small and medium enterprises in the South, please uh, come and talk to me because I am very eager to tap into your uh, potential. Final point in order to get into my magic eight. Um, I heard a lot this morning about um, data flows. I heard a lot about e-commerce. E-commerce is huge. Uh, again, to echo Brian, e-commerce is hugely important for small and medium enterprises in the South. Uh, I just was in Ethiopia last week, and it's uh, e-platforms what has allowed 2.5 million farmers in remote places in Ethiopia to be connected to a commodity exchange where they now can sell coffee and where they now can sell sesame. So this is exactly what is empowering these countries to develop, to reduce poverty, to empower women, to create youth, youth opportunities. So as we think of uh, regulating e-commerce, and as we think of uh, creating a framework for e-commerce, uh, we have to think also about the importance of making sure the South is associated to this regulation because there is a huge untapped potential in the South. So I hope I've whetted uh, a bit your appetite, um, but uh, this, is the, this is the story of a huge potential waiting to be tapped. Well, I think we've heard some really amazing points of view. Thank you, Arantxa. And um, <laughs> so, I'm going to ask one burning question that I was thinking as you were all talking, which is, you know, we've talked about the enormous opportunity for the developing community, developing economies in services, and services as enabler in many ways of manufacturing trade. Yet, there are so few developing countries part of the TISA, many of the multilateral negotiations are, um, and the bilateral negotiations are excluding developing countries. So. Why is it? Why do we not have better participation of developing countries in, these, in this plurilateral? Is it because we sort of de facto taking off the table the things they might be interested in, in terms of mode four, movement of natural persons, or transportation and maritime are off the table, and therefore they say it's not worth it? Is it that the smaller beneficiaries don't have a big enough voice to push their countries forward? What, what do you think is the driving factor, and what can we do as a coalition and as country companies to get more folks engaged and as China now is signaling interest, will that then, do you think, bring along potentially other developing countries into this negotiation? Whoever wants to go first. I, I'll say that and needless to say, we look at this primarily from an e-commerce, internet enabled trade perspective that uh, it may very well be that um, the pace of knowledge uh, acquisition by government trade negotiators and governments as to the impact and role of technology in their, in their trade and in their economy is, is kind of slow. And so I was at an event yesterday and throughout the term that I'd heard at a World Economic Forum discussion a couple of weeks ago called the velocity of governance the idea that people who are in the tech space tend to get very frustrated that government moves so much slower than, than, than it, you know, sort of the innovative t sort of tech world. And, it's, and, and half of that frustration is probably tech people being overly proud as to how innovative and fast moving they are. But part of it is that government's really slow. And I think trade negotiators primarily look at, as you said, their goals. Developing world trade negotiators are looking at their goals based on like a scorecard from, you know, 2000. And it's like a totally different world and there are totally different opportunities being brought about for developing countries and for small businesses because of the revolutionary changes driven by the internet and technology. And so I think there's like, there's a real learning curve there for governments to understand the story about Ethiopian. I mean, I don't know, I get all excited about the thought that you're talking about two and a half million really poor farmers who now can sell around the world and and the growth up and you know the wealth opportunity from that I mean is just really exciting and and the reality is in most national country governments and their trade 
their trade officials, you know, in Geneva. I was in Geneva earlier this year. And honestly, the story about how the internet is enabling small businesses is, it's a totally new story to them. And, and, and we did the eBay for development study in part because we had developed country trade negotiators saying, you gotta go talk to Indonesia. You know, you gotta go talk to China and you gotta go talk to India. And, um, and so we figured going to talk to them about how this is so great for small businesses in America probably wouldn't resonate quite as much as small businesses in their country. So I think there's a big learning curve there. Yeah. Anybody else? I, I agree that, uh, you know, risk aversion is a function of ignorance of, of how comfortable you feel with, uh, with uh, the animal that you're supposed to be touching. So if, you, if the animal that you are going to be touching is something that you don't know, that you don't feel comfortable with, you're not going to be wanting to get any anywhere near that animal. Mm -hmm. So this is why a big part of what we think we can do in the International Trade Center is educate, inverted commas, uh, those that uh, could be the regulators of those services sector, and granted technology is moving that fast, uh, so fast that it's very <coughs> difficult for regulators to really catch up with reality, but you know, they are more stable areas that, um, that are also tricky for regulators to regulate if they don't understand. You know, it used to be, services for developing countries used to be tourism. Tourism mit meaning hotel and beach. But it's not any longer just tourism, hotel and beach. It is also that. But it's now uh, medical tourism. It's a huge part of what uh, many of uh, these developing countries are uh, looking at. It's about logistics, it's about transport, it's about distribution, it's about ICT, huge. But you know, all of that you need to get to grasp with all these very technical areas in order to feel comfortable that you can go into an international negotiation to exchange your trade opening for somebody else's trade opening. And this is why, in my view, a lot of what we see in services is not liberalization through negotiation, but rather capturing in international agreements liberalization that is taking place at home. I, I think uh, I agree with much of what has been said, but I'd say there are three reasons that why developing countries hold back, and there are good reasons and bad reasons. I think the good reasons is, uh, I think, real concern about the ability to regulate in open markets and a sense of regulatory inadequacy, which in Elizabeth was what our answer says, but also the absence of meaningful regulatory cooperation. You know, for example, what happens if you let foreign branch banks in and then there are problems and you're not, you know, where Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of Britain says, you know, British loans for British firms and so you get an exodus of capital and then there is no meaningful cooperation what happens if Sh Zambia lets ShopRite into its country and then ShopRite becomes the dominant provider or South African Airways becomes the dominant provider and when you say, hey, we're worried about anti-competitive practices and the South African authority says this is not our jurisdiction. So I think there are good reasons you have to worry about, about how whether we can create meaningful regulatory cooperation to provide reassurance to developing country regulators that even if you open your markets, you're not going to be at the mercy of sort of either you know, fly-by-night operators or international oligopolies. I think there are also sort of bad reasons. There are vested interests in developing countries sometimes. They're, and they're not just domestic firms. There are sometimes foreign firms. AIG was in China long before anybody else. And they had a privileged access to the Chinese market. And I'm really curious about, and I'm going to ask John this question. Okay. When you said, I, I quote you, align with the government and the regulator, how do you play this? Is this the Chinese government being protectionist when it imposes significant capital adequacy requirements on individual branches? Or is this sensible prudential regulation? And how do you as a financial firm navigate through that? And the third reason is negotiating pessimism. Developing countries simply don't believe that they're going to get access in areas they care about. And that's where all of you who want access to developing countries should be lobbying hard domestically to try and push for improved access. When H-1B visa fees are increased, you should be screaming and shouting and saying this is not you know, in our best interest, but also that would send a positive signal. When there are issues of locking in cross-border trade so that this Democles sword that perpetually hangs over outsourcing 
it would be great if you guys were to say, we are prepared to lock in and have no restrictions on cross-border trade and services so that developing countries can be secure in their knowledge. So I think there are good reasons and bad reasons, and we need to think about both. So uh, I'll, I'll make uh, two comments. Uh, first of all, I think that China's interest uh, in, in participating in international uh, trade agreements also provides them the context to be able to drive change internally. So much like the WTO agreement, I know that there are some areas where China has not maybe lived up to the full letter or agreement of the WTO. The WTO agreement was very important that it allowed the Chinese government to kind of drive change internally with all their internal uh, you know, barriers to change. And so I think uh, they're signaling, besides the go out policy, I think they're signaling to be part of these other trade agreements would help them drive change inside their country. So I think that's uh, a very positive uh, view. Uh, with regard to uh, my comments with regard to alignment, if, if you understand, you know, when you're selling something, you want to understand your customer. And, and so I think if you can understand what the government regulators driving forces are, what the key initiatives that they're trying to get to, what their KPIs are, what their intents are, then you can, you know, rather than just bang your head against the door, you can align yourself or at least understand what they're trying to get to and, and, and maybe make your life a little bit simpler to try to get to your strategic goal. So when I talk about alignment, I, it's really more about understanding and communication. Uh, one of the things that, that AIG, you know, because we've been there so long, we do try to educate the regulators. We feel that an educated regulator, going back to your point, is, is, is much more easier to deal with. You can explain why you're trying to do something, what your financial, you know, when you, when you talked about the capital requirements, there's been a change in the capital requirements. There is now a WUFI, a wholly owned foreign uh, enterprise in, in China, which wasn't there before, which allows you to kind of concentrate your capital and then open up branches. The, the, uh, the, the, the Shanghai free trade zone that's gonna be opened up is gonna be another test tube area for capital, for services. And so I, I think that uh, uh, you know, aligning is, is more around understanding so that you can you know, really accomplish your goals. Great, I'm conscious of wanting to keep us on schedule. I'm looking for my, do we have time to do uh, an audience question, Peter, do you think? One question, burning question, hand up first. Thank you, uh, Rob Colarina, AIC Investment. Um, I think a question to um, Ar Arangsa with respect to this incubation area. What model has tend to work more? Is it um, one that has been a, a, an overseas investor partnering with a local investor for monitoring reasons and cooperations, or is it more of from afar? There's more patience and there's more um, there's more cooperation and, and productivity. I, I was curious if you could give some flavor to that. I think I think I could give you um, at least ten different models. I, I don't think there is one size fits all. I think it depends on the services sector, and it depends on the country in which uh, the incubation is taking place. Uh, in some countries, uh, the exporters, uh, so the services producers, are very close to being export ready. So maybe uh, the cooperation or the partnering, uh, if you put a B two B platform where the two are going to be talking. Um, it's easy, you unlock a huge uh, potential that was there, that was latent, that was ready to be used, uh, but wasn't because the right, you know, the wires were not properly connected. In some cases, the incubation has to be um, much more, uh, has to start more at the root. I mean, we've done, for example, pi we are piloting a very interesting project in Kenya, Again, trying to link farmers in very remote areas in Kenya through mobile technology, mobile technology that can be used either digitally or even through voice, going into uh, a central which uh, captures the signals in terms of prices and then uh, you know, ma marks um, a, a transaction, if you wish. Now there, we were starting from a, a, a much lower base, so it was you know, working with um, the technology company in order to develop uh, a solution that would be adaptable to the country in question. So I don't think there is one model. Uh, I think there are, there are as many as different services sector, just like 
you know, we talk about services, but services is a huge collective world uh, word uh, to uh, denominate many different uh, realities on the ground. Thank you. Will you all please join me in thanking this amazing panel? Yeah.